Hi, my name is Leonard Jason, and I'm at DePaul University. Social change is more likely to occur when we have a personal and passionate interest in the issue. In a sense, having a fire in your belly where you live and breathe about something you really care about. That's the starting point. In this talk, I will cover five principles that have frequently been used in social activism approaches, and they involve focusing on structural second-order change, confronting power abuses, mobilizing coalitions to correct the power abuses, having a long-term perspective, and fine-tuning interventions by using feedback from your efforts. These five principles are like an orchestra. All the principles need to be working at the same time in our efforts to bring about social change. I will use examples from work that I have conducted over the years, which I'm most familiar with, but the same principles have been used by many community activists and change agents. Our journey in the arena of social change often begins with the recognition that something is fundamentally wrong and unfair. This recognition may take the form of a flash of outrage, but the feeling is clear. This needs to change. Often we don't even know why we feel this way, but our intuition can steer us in the right direction. By listening and watching closely, ever-present signs and guides will provide us clues and direction, and the key is to be open and receptive to them. Decisions that are made based on intuition can often be as good or even better than ones made from more deliberate cognitive processes. We can learn from cues such as silence, tone of voice, indirect verbal messages, and hundreds of other unconscious dimensions that constantly impact us during everyday interactions. Paying attention to these kinds of subtle details, which fuel our intuition, can help us better appreciate the interpersonal dynamics among individuals, coalitions, and community groups that rally to bring about social justice. Intuition can steer us through the maze of misleading information, paradoxes, and obstacles to help us deal with stigma, discrimination, and power inequities. Let me give an example of the use of intuition when I was working on a media intervention with the Metropolitan Lung Association of Chicago and several community organizations that were developing a smoking cessation program to be launched on WGN television. We were going to print out over 100,000 self-help manuals and distribute them throughout Chicago, and these manuals could be used with the televised program. McDonald's offered us a lot of money to have them distributed through their stores. The planning committee thought this was a great idea of bringing in resources for this large community intervention. But I was passionate about the issue of helping quit smoking and of not having McDonald's be the place where we distributed the manuals. I blurted out during the meeting, you can't do that. Not one of my more diplomatic moments. Surely having passion and intuition need to be melded with a certain collaborative and flexible style. In any event, I regained my self-control and then went on to bring up a number of issues that indicated McDonald's was not the right setting to partner with given their unhealthy foods filled with salt and saturated fats. After considerable debate and discussion, the group decided to offer the free self-help manuals through a chain of other retail stores in Chicago rather than McDonald's. Intuition guided me in this quick reaction as it has in much of my work over the past few decades. The first principle of social change emphasizes the importance of determining whether the desired change is a short-term fix or an enduring solution that addresses the root of the problem. As we know, there are two different approaches to social change, which are called first-order and second-order change. First-order change is a strategy that attempts to eliminate deficits and problems for individuals, but rarely addresses the causes that contribute to these problems. First-order change is cosmetic and only provides, at best, short-term solutions. Clearly, the pressing and intransigent problems that face our nation require more comprehensive solutions. Sadly, most current interventions to solve these problems are first-order strategies. Herein lies the paradox. First-order change interventions are alluring 
because they promise to solve the most deeply rooted problems with simple solutions, yet they fail at the most basic levels. These types of interventions can render people powerless to overcome their oppression or unable to break out of a cycle of crime or addiction. Unlike the first order interventions, our first principle focuses on second order change that influences the individual and his or her social network, as well as all the other components of the environment that may contribute to the particular problem. Only through more structural interventions that involve both individuals and their social environments will we make a significant difference in solving our social problems. Second order interventions direct precious resources in more productive ways. They go beyond the reactive response by enacting measures to avoid potential problems. True second order change also involves altering shared goals, roles, and power relationships. Let me give an example of a second order change intervention. Up to the early 1980s, thousands of children were either injured or killed in car accidents each year due to not being in appropriate infant and car seats. In fact, the leading cause of death for children under one year of age was car accidents when infants were not in appropriate infant seats. In the early 1980s, I was involved with the National Coalition with Steve Fawcett and others that was trying to influence legislators to pass legislation that would require infants and children to wear a seatbelt or to be placed in an appropriate car or infant seat while in cars. In Illinois, we worked with a community-based organization that was trying to get needed child restraint legislation. And this was a time when there was no laws requiring youth to be in appropriate car seats or infant seats. Our hunch was that data collected on behavioral and self-report information could be used to influence the debate about passing needed legislation. For months, we looked inside cars to see whether or not infants and children were placed in car restraints. We also used telephone interviews to collect information about the public's attitude toward the child restraint bill. The goal was to use both data collection on attitudes and first-hand observations to build a more convincing case when trying to influence policy officials. Although we were also working closely with an Illinois organization that was advocating for the passage of this bill, we were unsure if our data would persuade legislators. We sent the information to a randomly selected half of the Illinois state legislators prior to a vote on the child passenger restraint bill. In that letter, the senators were informed that 140 children in Illinois were killed and 25,828 injured in automobile accidents over the last six years in Illinois. We also pointed out that, through our observations, 93% of Illinois children were not in adequate restraints while riding in cars. We also provided the legislators with the results of our survey, in which 78% of adults supported the child passenger restraint bill. We made sure that our letter was received one week before the vote and that the information was clear and concise. In this way, we increased our chances that the letter would be both read and remembered. We also gave senators specific data, particularly on low rates of safety seat usage and citizen enthusiasm for our proposed legislation. Lastly, we gathered information regarding the state's share of medical care costs following debilitating car accidents. By sending this critical information to half of the legislators, we were able to see whether our targeted letter had made a difference in encouraging support for this important legislation. Of course, we cannot guarantee that our data was not used to influence both groups of senators, and it might very well have been. However, significantly more senators, 79%, who received the information voted for the passage of the bill, whereas only 53% of the senators who did not receive the letter voted for the bill. In either case, we are gratified that the majority of senators in both groups voted for the passage of the legislation that would help protect children. Our intervention was a success, and even the governor requested a copy of our findings before finally signing the legislation. The Illinois Child Passenger Restraint Law required children under the age of four to be placed in an approved child or infant car seat. Also, children aged 4 to 6 
were required to be placed in either an approved restraint system or a secure seat belt. We compared our results from periods of time before and after the month when the law went into effect. With passage of the legislation for children between the ages of 1 to 4, use increased from 13 to 42 percent, as can be seen in the slide. Rates of appropriate restraints increased from 49 to 74 percent for infants less than one year of age. Most importantly, children's deaths caused by traffic accidents decreased by 53 percent when compared to a period two years before the law was enacted to two years after. Deaths decreased from 49 to 23 as indicated on this slide. Comments made by members of the Illinois Child Passenger Safety Association included, the data were helpful and important and of high quality to have as part of the armamentarium. Another comment was, the data were very, very interesting. It was a building block in the passage of the bill. Another comment was, those who had the data and understood them, it made them more forceful and vocal in support of the bill. So what do we conclude? In this study, we worked collaboratively with community-based organizations, and our data did influence legislative officials to support laws that contributed to second-order change, in this case, protecting the safety of infants and children. Creating second-order change can seem overwhelming, especially when powerful people or organizations control whether or not your change will be enacted. Power can be seen as a negative and corrupting force, or as a useful resource used to accomplish social justice objectives. Power is often used to control resources, for example, who is hired or provided funding. Power can be used to restrict channels for participation in community decisions, such as dictating meeting agendas. Also, power can be used to shape the definition of a public issue. Examples are censorship or discrediting a group's views or beliefs. Most incarnations of social inequality are caused or exacerbated by an underlying abuse of power. Redistributing power is often a crucial component to a successful large-scale second-order social movement. Often the causes of abuse in underlying power structures may be difficult to see clearly. Our gut instincts may be our most powerful tool to uncover the veiled power abuses that need to be challenged. We must use the same passion and intuition that helps one see the path towards effective second-order change to identify and analyze the distribution of power. For example, I knew in the mid-1970s that the tobacco industry was responsible for enticing many young people to begin smoking, and this industry actively fought attempts to limit advertising with their product and as well as any efforts to reduce access of tobacco to youth. We know that smoking is the leading preventable cause of death in the United States, killing over 400,000 people each year. This is more people than die each year of all the following causes combined. AIDS, homicide, suicide, automobile accidents, illegal drug use, and fires. For decades, the tobacco industry had been involved in multiple efforts to widely distribute cigarettes to both adults and youth. They had enormous resources to fight anti-tobacco activities. My interests were in trying to reduce youth from starting to smoke. In the United States, tobacco use begins at an early age, typically before high school graduation. Among persons under the age of 18, every day 5,500 youth try cigarettes for the first time, and nearly 3,000 more youth become established smokers. It is estimated that one out of every three youth who become regular smokers will die prematurely from tobacco-related illnesses. In the early 1980s, my research team was working with schools in implementing smoking prevention programs but we were informed by the students that merchants were openly selling them cigarettes. It was the youth who pointed out the contradiction between our tobacco prevention messages and community merchants who openly sold cigarettes to them. Person-oriented approaches such as ours were being compromised by social and environmental factors such as merchants selling tobacco to youth. 
the tobacco industry had a lot of money, and in this case, money meant a lot of power to influence any laws that could affect their sales. But how to stop the tobacco industry that encouraged the majority of stores to sell miners tobacco? In 1988, our intuition pushed us to explore the students' critical input. We decided to assess illegal commercial sales of tobacco, and when we sent youth into stores to purchase cigarettes, we found that 80% of merchants sold cigarettes to minors. After the local Chicago media widely publicized our study's findings, Officer Talbot from the suburban town of Woodridge, Illinois, contacted me. We decided to collaborate on a study by which minors were sent into 28 stores in his town to see if they could purchase tobacco. We found that the majority of stores did sell minors tobacco. We next collaborated with Officer Talbot and the Woodridge Police on passing legislation in which vendors caught illegally selling tobacco and minors found in possession of tobacco would receive a fine. Officer Talbot and I reasoned that regularly sending in minors to stores to purchase cigarettes and finding those that illegally sold tobacco to minors would reduce illegal merchant sales to, to minors. However, Officer Talbot also felt it would be important to reduce minors' public smoking by fining minors with a parking-style ticket for possession of tobacco. Two years after implementing the two-pronged program, rates of merchant cigarette sales to minors decreased from an average of 70% to less than 5%, as you can see on the slide. And adolescent smoking decreased over 50% in a Woodridge Junior High School. In this study, all resources came from Woodridge, Illinois. In addition, Officer Talbot had become a national figure as Woodridge was the first U.S. city to demonstrate that cigarette smoking could be effectively decreased through legislation and enforcement. Our study was widely publicized, such as in this New York Times article. Over the subsequent years, Officer Talbot advised communities throughout the country on how to establish effective laws, and he testified at congressional hearings in Washington, D.C. in support of the national laws governing cigarette sales to minors. They're now known as Sinar Amendment. States are now bound by federal law to reduce illegal sales of tobacco to minors. Officer Talbot was instrumental not only in the passage of this federal amendment, but also in working with grassroots organizations throughout the United States in disseminating this successful innovation. Because of this research, I was asked to testify in front of the House Commerce Committee, the Subcommittee on Health and Environment, during the tobacco settlement hearings of the 1990s. My testimony focused on comprehensive strategies to reduce youth access to tobacco and to bring down high rates of youth smoking. For over 20 years, we continued documenting the effectiveness of efforts to reduce illegal sales of tobacco to minors, as well as decreasing youth tobacco use. A study by Joe DeFranza and others in 2009 found that because of the Sinar Amendment and state efforts to reduce youth access to tobacco, there has been a 21% decrease in the odds of 10th graders becoming daily smokers. Our research had made a difference. There's now a global consensus that sales to minors should be prevented illustrated by the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. This framework was unanimously adopted by the World Health Assembly and has since attracted more than 172 member states, representing almost 90% of the world's population. Our efforts aimed at preventing young people from gaining access to tobacco eventually did influence a paradigm shift, a federal amendment that led to states curtailing for the first time illegal sales of cigarettes to minors. By focusing on both the youth and their environments and ultimately changing policy, we went from over 80% of merchants selling minors tobacco illegally to now the vast majority of merchants do not sell this dangerous drug to minors. Our efforts were able to address the power structures involved 
challenging the tobacco industry's formidable resources to manipulate American youth and provide them easy access to tobacco. What we concluded was, for issues that had important policy implications, such as sales of tobacco to minors, power holders like the tobacco industry had to be challenged by coalitions that also hold leverage, and community psychologists could play an important role in this effort. Looking at the two examples involving child safety and automobiles, as well as tobacco use, we really need to think in public health terms to solve many of our social problems. For example, with tobacco, over many years, a major sea change occurred in our societal norms that went from endorsing tobacco in our movies and popular culture to one in which smoking is marginalized due to not being allowed in many public settings. Substantial and permanent change in norms can be used to solve many of our social problems. In a sense, the same public health strategies that have changed the way we think of tobacco and child safety in cars could be employed with other major problems, such as violence due, due to the easy availability of guns. Focused and collective efforts can lead to broad second-order change through the use of our third principle, identifying and mobilizing individuals and community groups to influence the cultural and political landscape affecting social change. The key is citizen participation in democratic processes that assure that community members have meaningful involvement in decisions that affect them. The third principle of social change is that community coalitions can change power structures that perpetuate first order institutional ways of treating people. As an example, allowing vulnerable people suffering from addiction to be discharged from treatment facilities into dangerous and non-supportive environments is not acceptable in a civilized society. We release over 600,000 prisoners each year back to the community, where many face desperate living situations with untreated addictions. Bottom-up social change movements can create alternative programs that help people in recovery integrate back into safe and supportive communities with low-cost housing options. Providing housing and job support is critical in helping them regain the skills and foundation needed to lead productive lives. Alcohol and substance use disorders affects approximately 22 million Americans. For many with substance use disorders, treatment begins in a detoxification program. A time-limited therapeutic program will typically follow. However, these programs are becoming briefer as funding has decreased. For many with addictions, detoxification does not lead to sustained recovery. Instead, these individuals repeatedly cycle through service delivery systems. The missing element for many patients is a supportive, cohesive setting following treatment for substance use disorders. The Oxford House Network represents one model for helping reintegrate people back into communities. Oxford Houses provide affordable and safe housing for people recovering from substance use disorders. This self-help organization has grown over the last three decades from one Oxford House to over 1,500. Residences are rented single-family homes for six to 12 individuals. They are completely self-governed with no professional staff. This slide shows a picture of one Oxford House and its members. Here's another Oxford House. Today over 10,000 people live in these houses across the United States, with new Oxford Houses now being created in Europe and Africa. Oxford Houses are the largest single self-help residential recovery program in the U.S. Houses are self-supporting and democratically run. In 1991, I saw Paul Malloy on CBS's 60 Minutes talking about his unique creation. My intuition was that I should call him, although I had never done anything like this before. I called Paul and said I was a community psychologist and wondered if anyone had done any evaluations of Oxford Houses and said I'd be happy to work with him. Out of that initial conversation grew a long-term collaborative partnership between a university-based research team and a grassroots community-based organization. Oxford House representatives and my research team spent a year getting to know each other by attending each other's team meetings before beginning our project. 
Oxford House members helped us to fashion and adapt our interview questions. After collecting pilot data for several years, we then began working on a grant proposal, which we submitted and then resubmitted in hopes of receiving funding to more intensively study the effectiveness of Oxford Houses. However, the National Institutes of Health reviewers wanted us to conduct a randomized study where some individuals got the Oxford House condition and some didn't. But we felt this wasn't possible as each Oxford House votes on whether to allow new people to live in their house. After seven years of working on this, we finally mentioned to Paul Malloy that we probably wouldn't be able to get funding from the federal government. At that point, Paul said he'd work with us to make it happen. If we needed to do a randomized study, he would make it happen. You see, we had worked for seven years getting to know each other. What I didn't know is that another research group had approached Paul Malloy a few years before I approached him, and they said they wanted to do a randomized study. He told them no, as he had not built up a supportive relationship of trust with them. With the support of Paul Malloy and the Illinois Oxford House chapter, we did finally receive federal funding for a study for which we recruited 150 people who were finishing addiction treatment at an alcohol and other drug use treatment facility in Illinois. Half were randomly assigned to live in an Oxford house, while the other half randomly assigned to receive standard traditional aftercare services. We interviewed each participant every six months over two years. At our 24-month follow-up, we found that participants assigned to a communal living Oxford house had less substance use, with 69% abstinent in the Oxford house condition versus only 35% in the usual care control condition. We also found those assigned to the Oxford house were less likely to commit a crime, with only 3% of the Oxford house participants incarcerated at the 24-month follow-up versus 9% for the usual aftercare group. Finally, those assigned to the Oxford House had better incomes at the 24-month follow-ups, earning $989 per month versus only $440 per month for the usual aftercare group. Together, the productivity and incarceration benefits yielded more than a half a million dollars in savings for the Oxford House condition. In conclusion, the people who were provided an opportunity to live in an Oxford house were twice as likely to remain abstinent over the next two years and had significantly higher incomes and significantly lower incarceration rates. This second order intervention had a powerful influence on the lives of people who were offered this empowering setting. These findings were widely disseminated the study suggests that there are significant public policy benefits for these types of lower cost, non-medical, community-based care options for individuals with alcohol and other drug problems. These findings were subsequently used to influence both judicial decisions as well as state level policies. Some communities oppose sharing their neighborhood with group homes like Oxford House. For example, laws are passed that make it illegal for more than five unrelated people to live in a house. This deliberately targets Oxford House, which usually needs six to ten house members to make rent affordable. After the release of our outcome study, I was called by a lawyer who asked if we could help him with a dispute involving a town trying to close down the local Oxford House by claiming there could be no more than five unrelated individuals living in the house. We quickly looked into a national Oxford House data set and examined how the number of residents in Oxford House affected residents' individual outcomes for recovery. We found that a larger house size of 8 to 10 residents corresponded with less criminal and aggressive behavior. These results were used in this court case and others to successfully argue against closing Oxford Houses that had six or more non-related residents. Paul Malloy sent this note to me regarding one judicial case that was recently resolved with the help of our data. And I quote, The dispute has been ongoing for six years. The town will pay attorney's fees, which are about $105,000, and a fine to the Department of Justice. The key to their decision appears to be your research showing that larger houses had better outcomes than the smaller ones. Thanks. Once again, reason and logic prevailed. End of quote. 
The findings from several of our studies garnered much attention and helped to legitimize the Oxford House model for public policy officials. More significantly, it provided support for the expansion of the model throughout the country. Based on a work with this organization, the federal government listed Oxford Houses within the National Registry of Evidence-Based Programs and Practices. We've also investigated ways to expand these types of effective programs to the community. One way was to implement an intervention involving a $4,000 loan program and a recruiter to open up Oxford Houses. To explore this, we used a multiple baseline design to chart the expansion of Oxford Houses in different states. The horizontal line indicates years, and the vertical line refers to number of houses. Very few Oxford Houses were established during the years before the start of the intervention. We then introduced an intervention, as indicated by the vertical dotted line at the top of the figure, in one group of states, and a few years later introduced the same intervention in the second group of states, indicated by the vertical dotted line at the bottom of the figure. As states instituted the intervention, the number of houses expanded considerably. The advocacy engaged in by community coalitions such as Oxford House and DePaul University can change power structures that perpetuate institutional ways of treating people. Bottom-up social change movements can create inexpensive, community-based, structured programs that allow people to be reintegrated into society. Community coalitions, according to the third principle of social change, can be mobilized to transform many of the most serious problems that affect our society. These second-order interventions can revolutionize how we treat our most vulnerable citizens. Second-order change takes time. Progress can be gradual and uneven, and there will be setbacks along the way. Patience and a long-term commitment, the fourth principle of social change, are critical aspects of social change movements. Both patience and persistence are even more essential in opposing powerful vested interests intent on maintaining the status quo and in amassing coalitions to confront institutionalized abuses of power. Having an intuition that one's vision will be fulfilled in the long run can be a sustaining and life-affirming force in the face of oppressive conditions. Small wins can also help sustain and mobilize citizen groups to continue to pursue even larger objectives. Saul Linsky knew that starting with smaller problems and actions and succeeding was a first step toward tackling larger, more intimidating social problems. Alinsky has addressed one of the most difficult questions in social change. How can activists stay committed to a cause? In the meaningful pursuit of social justice, the importance of small wins cannot be overemphasized. Let me give an example of a social change effort with a long time commitment. I'll focus on a chronic illness known as chronic fatigue syndrome, CFS. Many healthcare professionals continue to doubt the scientific validity of this diagnosis. The social construction of this disorder as a psychogenic illness of neurotic women, similar to early depictions of multiple sclerosis, has contributed to the negative attitudes that healthcare providers have toward those with this syndrome. This has had serious negative impacts on patients with this illness. For example, several investigators have found that 95% of individuals seeking medical treatment for CFS reported feelings of estrangement, and others have found that 66% of individuals with CFS believed that they were made worse by their doctor's care. Patients have been characterized as having a yuppie flu disease affecting middle class and affluent people. In addition, the name given to the illness by the CDC, Centers for Disease Control, trivialized and stigmatized it, and the CDC's case definition of CFS was not well defined. Tests used to diagnose CFS were biased toward finding psychiatric problems, and treatment approaches were potentially harmful. As an example, here is the activity of a healthy person over two days, with the red line indicating amount of activity every minute. 
this healthy person had diurnal patterns of high and low activity over the course of the days. But the patient with CFS has none of these patterns, as you see on this slide. However, the overall amount of activity is the same for the person with CFS and the healthy person. So many researchers concluded that as overall activity was similar, the patients with CFS only had a perception that they had limitations in energy and activity. Clearly, this was an inappropriate interpretation of the data. It was intuition that steered me through this maze to decide on a course of action. Some of this stigma was caused by researchers. For example, studies by the CDC in the late 1980s and early 1990s suggested that only about 20,000 people had this illness, and they were characterized as having yuppie flu. If medical personnel believe that CFS is a relatively rare yuppie flu disorder, then physicians might minimize or misinterpret the physical complaints of patients with CFS, and this could lead to the mistrust and lack of communications that had been reported between patients and the medical personnel. My gut feeling was to reach out to patients, professionals, and organizations who might become allies, even though I had no prior contact with them. An intuitive feeling inside me indicated this was risky, but at the same time, an essential starting point. Over time, a network of collaborators assembled, including several patients and graduate students, the CEO of the largest CFS patient organization, an epidemiologist, a physician, a psychiatrist, a biostatistician, and a survey research scientist. Our group looked over the literature and realized that the prevalence estimates carried out by the scientists at the CDC used case ascertainment methods where physicians identified patients who presented with unexplained fatigue-related symptoms and then referred those patients for a medical examination to determine whether they had met criteria for CFS. Many low-income individuals did not have access to medical settings and thus might not have been included in the prevalent studies. Moreover, because many physicians doubted the existence of CFS, they might not have made referrals to CFS prevalence research studies. Our team decided that the issue of prevalence needed to be dealt with first. You see, if few people have an illness, often Few resources are devoted to those with the illness, but our intuition led us to believe that rates might be much higher. So we wrote and submitted several grants to the federal government and proposed conducting a prevalence study that would be based on a true random community sample. The reviewers were very critical. They said that the CDC had already done studies and found very few people with CFS. So in our random community sample of 28,000 people, we probably wouldn't find just about anybody with the illness. In an effort to refute this criticism and with financial support from the largest CFS patient self-help organization, we conducted a small pilot study that had about 1,000 people in it. We interviewed these individuals, a random community sample, and then basically worked up medically and psychiatrically those who had some of the symptoms of CFS. Our pilot data suggested rates were much higher than the CDC had estimated. With these data, we again approached the program officials at NIH with the intention of resubmitting our CFS prevalence grant. We were surprised when they informed us they weren't interested in a CFS prevalence study. Our intuition again led us not to give up and we kept resubmitting grants until we were successful in securing NIH funding. In our study, we did screen a large community random sample for CF CFS symptoms, and then those that had the CFS symptoms were medically and psychiatrically examined. Rather than 20,000 people with this illness, we found that CFS prevalence rates to be closer to about 800,000 to a million people. Moreover, about 90% of the people identified as having CFS in this sample had not been previously diagnosed by a physician prior to participating in our study. Women, Latinos, middle-aged individuals, and persons of middle to lower socioeconomic status 
were found to be at higher risk for this illness. These findings directly contradicted the perception that middle to upper class Caucasian women were most at risk for this illness. The largest self-help organization widely publicized our findings indicating that ethnic minorities had higher CFS rates than European Americans and that CFS rates were not greater among those with higher incomes. So much for CFS being a rare yuppie flu. Working on building the collaborative team, collecting the pilot data, securing the NIH grant, and collecting and analyzing the prevalence data took a 10-year period of time. It is easy to become overwhelmed when confronting complex problems or power holders, but by focusing on one small piece at a time, tangible change and success can be achieved. We considered each of these collaborative investigations as small wins. In addition, because of the wide attention that was given the community-based CFS prevalence research, I was appointed the chairperson of the research subcommittee of the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, which made recommendations regarding CFS to the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Resources. In this capacity, I was able to work on other policy-related issues, such as the inappropriate name given this illness, an expanded case definition that the CDC introduced, and leadership problems at the CDC regarding their program of CFS research. This would take another 10 years of working with a number of coalitions involving patient and scientific organizations. Social change agents must endure many assaults on their commitment and stamina. Trusting your intuition and community support can provide somewhat of a shield, but there's no doubt that small wins function as a life-affirming oasis for activists. Long-term commitments are often critical to being able to bring about social change. The effects of social action are often not immediate or easily identifiable. While the dynamic nature of social activism campaigns may make evaluation challenging, measuring progress is vital and lies at the heart of each community strategy and represents the last principle of social change. Evaluations can help redefine the essence of each principle of social change. Program evaluations can also reveal weaknesses, identify where the weaknesses stem from, and help focus efforts on critical stages of systemic change. There are many ways to document the success rate of a change effort and just as many ways to chart its progress. When trying to analyze the nature of a social problem or find a solution for it, Surveying changes in attitudes, behavior, or policies is critically important. Our intuition often helps us decide how best to measure change. As an example of this evaluation process, I will describe what has become known as the dog pooper study. After inviting the alderman to a community psychology class, I said to myself I would tackle whatever he mentioned as his most pressing community issue. When he responded to me that it was uncollected dog feces, my mouth fell open in disbelief. But I had pledged to work on what the alderman mentioned was the most pressing problem. So I counted all fresh dog feces within an eight by five block area surrounding DePaul University. The fact that 11,400 droppings were within this area suggested that dog litter was a serious and prevalent problem within this community. Next, several graduate students and I selected a long block within the DePaul University area and recorded the following variables for five hours daily. The number of dogs, the number of dogs who defecated, and the number of dog defecations picked up by their owners. In addition, if you can believe it, all defecations were picked up and weighed each morning. During the baseline phase, few dog owners were observed to pick up after their dogs and over 19 pounds of dog defecations were deposited in the target block. We found that when anti-litter signs were posted during the second phase, relatively few changes occurred on the criterion measures. However, during the next phase, when all dog owners were given instructions and a demonstration concerning how to use a plastic bag to pick up dog feces, 
82% of dog owners proceeded to pick up after their dogs. These findings indicate that the prompting intervention, which applied instructions and modeling, effectively motivated dog owners to dispose of their dog's waste properly. After my testimony at hearings the Chicago Alderman sponsored, which was televised on the news for television stations, the Chicago Daily News wrote the following. In what surely must be the most bizarre academic studies in the nation, they subsequently calculated from our work that 382,000 pounds of dog excrement was deposited on city streets daily. The reporter Ellen Warren told me that the story generated great readership interest. This was followed by an editorial in the Chicago Sun-Times that said the following, We're not sure what contribution this study makes to the discipline of psychology, but if it persuades the city council to pass a stronger ordinance to discipline dog owners, it will have been more than worth the effort. The city could always fund the professor's research project. The pursuit of knowledge aside, it did manage to clean up one neighborhood. The study had hit a nerve, and in one newspaper, there was even a photo opinion asking residents, should owners clean up after their dogs? In another newspaper, there was a cartoon that had a dog with a diaper with the title, Solution to a Problem. Following the completion of this study, several community groups contacted me for advice in setting up their own dog litter interventions. As an example, we worked with one community group which expressed interest in ameliorating the dog litter problem in their neighborhood. This slide shows the area and number of dog droppings on different streets that we counted. At a 13-month follow-up, the target block, as well as an area around the target block, had significant reductions in dog litter as a function of our intervention. The community residents who participated in our collaborative program continued exerting pressure on dog owners to pick up after dogs even after the formal intervention ended. In summary, the dog intervention studies documented effective approaches for combating the inveterate problem of dog waste in urban areas. At the study's end, a Chicago alderman asked me to present our findings at City Hall in order to support a proposed ordinance which would require dog owners to have in their possession a pooper scooper when walking dogs. This ordinance was passed by the City Council, making Chicago one of the first cities in the country to pass a pooper scooper ordinance. The alderman, to whom I had originally provided the data, mentioned to me that this study, which had received considerable media exposure, had helped change the politician's perception of this problem. In this slide, the alderman wrote, and I quote, In the past, this problem has often been scoffed at and not taken seriously. Your comments regarding the dog defecation problem altered that perception greatly, end of quote. The legislators were willing, for the first time, to seriously consider enacting legislation to help alleviate the dog litter problem. Chicago's ordinance became a model for other similar ordinances in towns around the country. Our final principle of social change, measurement, provides the opportunity to consider the tangible short and long-term results of our activities. Using evaluation techniques such as self-report data and observed changes, we can determine whether or not a particular intervention or social change strategy has achieved its goals. Few initiatives, no matter how positive, are successful without some type of documentation to support our efforts. The five principles of social change are on this final slide. When identifying power holders, one also needs to recognize how they first arrived in that position and why they have continued to maintain control. Without this knowledge, tactics to thwart their efforts could be fruitless or only first order change could occur. Similarly, community leaders need to work with or create coalitions in order to form strategies to produce real, enduring change. Activists also need to stay committed to an issue over time and evaluate their actions. In this talk, I've mentioned the use of intuition. It's a process and domain to be uncovered or discovered, as it's an essential quality and disposition within us all. 
we can emphasize its relevance as when we acknowledge a feeling or sense of next steps that need to be taken in strategic coalition building or political action. We need to create space for this domain as having an intuition that one's vision will be fulfilled in the long run can be a sustaining and life-affirming force in the face of oppressive conditions. Social policy change leaders will often rely on conjuring up a dream and sustaining it with intuition in order to overcome the obstacles that we face in our community work. Over the past hour, I've provided concrete examples of how I use the five principles of social change to reduce children's death through encouraging use of appropriate seat restraints, to reduce youth access to tobacco, as well as decreasing youth tobacco use, to promote the expansion of safe housing for people with addictions, to challenge inappropriate myths and stigma regarding chronic fatigue syndrome, and to promote laws to reduce uncollected dog litter. Each principle of social change represents part of the social change journey, but they are subtly interrelated. When used tactfully in concert, they can create an unstoppable force in any movement.